day. And you know, money money's a really funny thing. I mean, it causes people to do really, really crazy stuff. And by money, I mean the paper that our government prints that represents gold that we don't have. That's what I mean by money. If you really think about it, it is insane what people are willing to do for monopoly money, essentially. I mean, because that's, that's really what our money is. It's a promissory note for our gold storage that we don't have. When we say, hey, look, we're uh, running out of money, what do we do? Well, just print some more. <laughs> wouldn't that be awesome? Well, that's what we do. But wouldn't that be cool if you could actually do that and it wouldn't be illegal? That would be really great. Because then you could print all the money you would ever want or you think you would ever want or you would ever need. Uh, money was always kind of a fickle, funny thing when I was uh, growing up because we didn't really have a whole lot of it. And whatever we did have, you know, when I say we, I really mean my parents. Uh, whatever we did have, you know, we usually spent pretty well. And it's kind of fun spending other people's money, isn't it? I mean, that's, that's kind of what our government does. They say, hey, look, you spend your time and we'll take some of it and we'll do whatever we want with it. Because after all, the government is the best uh, people in charge that, you know, know how to spend, spend our money. But as kids, you know, you're kind of like the government as a kid because you don't work for it. And your parents have to give it to you because it's their obligation and responsibility, and you get to spend it. And it was always fun spending my parents' money because you didn't have to do anything for it. And so I'd walk up to my parents, I'd say, hey, mom and dad, I'd like to have this, you know, thing, whatever it was. And they'd say, yeah, you're going to have to work for it. Not going to happen. <laughs> Not going to happen. I can actually remember my parents, they created this, re they were, you know, they thought they were wise enough to create this reward system for us to do stuff around the house. I'll never forget it. It was a chart, and it would have things that we were supposed to do, and then money that we would get from it. And if we wanted money, we would do the chores. Walk the dog, three bucks. Do the dishes, three bucks. Yeah, it was a little, I, I feel like that's kind of cheap myself. But, you know, clean up the floors. $2.50. I remember they had little increments, you know, different things are a little bit harder. You got a little bit money, a little bit more money for it. And I remember standing in front of the fridge, looking at it. And I kind of laughed at myself and I said, not going to happen. <laughs> you know what? I'll just have my parents do it. After they work all day, they could come home and they could clean up the mess. I'm just going to, I'm just going to watch some TV, you know, just watch some more social stuff with my sister. She would always have control over the TV, so I basically watch whatever she would want. But money, money is something that it really drives us all nuts. I mean, the Bible says the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil. Not money itself, but when money has uh, this objective reality in our own hearts and our own minds and we fall in love with it, it can become the root of all sorts of evil. Jesus is gonna tell us a little bit about how we should approach our treasure as we manage what we should consider God's money. So if you have your Bibles, we're gonna be in Luke chapter 16 this morning. As I said, money, money is a funny thing. Uh, we not only like to spend it, but ultimately, you know, we do like to waste it. I mean, if you think about it like this, right? Do you know how much food the United States wastes annually, in money terms, $165 billion worth of food we waste annually. That is crazy. We waste stuff all the time. I want to ask you the question, what is the dumbest thing you have ever spent your money on? The dumbest thing. That was a total waste of money. I, there are too many to count for me. I mean, just a total waste of money. You ever been to an amusement park before? You walk up, you say, Leia, I like to have a, uh, a Diet Coke, and uh, I'll just go a little bit cheaper, do a hot dog. That'll be $17 in your firstborn. <laughs> you're like, what is going on here? Oh, by the way, you're not allowed to bring food into the park. You have to buy our stuff, our food. Like, this is ridiculous. And amusement parks are almost as bad as Starbucks. Now, I did get some Starbucks this morning, but, you know, the first time we go into Starbucks, I'm like, hey, you know, I want to try a latte, pumpkin spice latte, just because that's what I'm going to do. Don't, don't hate on me, okay? Walk up, and I'm like, man, what's the cheapest version of a pumpkin spice latte I can get? I, and I say that, look, just give me the most inexpensive pumpkin spice latte that you got. That'll be $23. <laughs> I'm like, what is happening? Why We waste money all the time. If you don't think you waste money, you probably do, and you just don't realize it. We collect toys for our kids. And you know, holy smokes, I actually feel bad for my parents now because now that I have kids, they are so expensive. It's ridiculous. All I do is spend money on our mortgage 
and on food and on diapers and wipes. I feel like that's all we ever spend money on. And sometimes occasional clothes when they get holes in them. We try to wait until then. And I was like, holy cow, how much money are we going to waste every single month on new stuff? And then every once in a while, you get a little bonus surprise for all your hard work. And you're changing a diaper and a finger goes in a direction that it shouldn't. And you get your bonus for the month a tragic experience in which you are horrified. And so what do you get for all your labor and hard work? Really, just kind of not a whole lot other than maybe some morally sound children, right? I mean, money, we just spend money on everything. Well, how should we manage money? How should we approach our treasure in this life? Well, the Bible has a lot to say about it. You know, I think we would really understand the significance of money if instead of handing money or swiping the credit card, we had to pay with our time. You walk up to Starbucks and you're like, hey, I'd like the tall latte, the cheapest thing you got. That'll be 30 minutes of your life. Would you do it? I mean, if you think in terms, yes, I know. If you think in terms of things that you buy, in terms of time, how long you'd have to hand your life over for, I think that would change our perspective on our treasure, wouldn't it? But isn't that reality what our money is? We work, we toil, we labor, we get money in, we put money out, and we spend our time earning money for the things that we want. Jesus is talking to his disciples in Luke chapter 16. And he has talked in Luke chapter 15 about the passionate pursuit of the love of God and how he is willing to chase us down. And the Pharisees could not stand it because the Pharisees could care less for people. They weren't lovers of people. They were lovers of money. They only used and manipulated the people around them in order for their own personal and selfish gain. They were really concerned more about the temple tax and putting money in their pocket rather than loving God and loving people with their treasure. And so here's Jesus in Luke chapter 16. He just tells the story of the prodigal son, that God is someone who has his arms wide open, sitting on the front porch, rocking in his rocking chair, waiting for the lost sinner to come home. And the Pharisees couldn't stand it. They didn't want people understanding that God was gracious and forgiving and loving. They didn't want to believe that God was like somebody who would be willing to break down the entire house for the one lost coin. Or God would be willing to go after the one sheep who was lost over the 99. They didn't want to believe that God was willing to love us to the point where he would accept us even after we rejected him and we've left him. And so Jesus, knowing the Pharisees are listening as he instructs his disciples, talks about treasure and the kind of perspective that we should have. Here what, here's what he says in verse 1. Jesus told this story to his disciples. There was a certain rich man who had a manager handling his affairs. And one day a report came that the manager was wasting the employer's money. So the employer called him and said, what's this I hear about you? Get your report in order because you are going to be fired. (laughs) You've mismanaged my money. Somebody's told on you. I found out. Get your report in order. You're done. You no longer work for me. The manager thought to himself, now what? What am I going to do? My boss has fired me. I don't have the strength to dig ditches. (laughs) And I'm too proud to beg. In other words, (coughs) I'm too lazy to dig and I'm too proud to beg for money. What am I going to do? And I think that we sometimes in our culture, we find some of the same kind of people, don't we? And so here Jesus is going to start off with this illustration. You've got this person in charge of the manager's household, just like you and I. They're responsible for the assets, and yet they've mismanaged his funds, and it's time to get fired. He's a poor steward. He's not having right, the right accountability or the right responsibility with what the master has uh, instilled to him. And there's some reasons. First of all, he's wasteful. He is extravagant with his expenses. And let's be honest in our culture, okay? Let's just take a step back and not pretend that we're something that we're not. Every single person in this room, including myself, has been extravagant with the things that we've spent our money on, right? I mean, come on. Look at our closets. Look at our homes. Look at the cars that we drive. We are, not li- we are living way above our means. We are not living under our means. I mean, we are really, we say this, blessed. We've got a lot of stuff. And this guy here has really been living, if I were to use my Ohio combination of words, you guys know what I'm talking about, he was having an elavagant lifestyle. (laughs) My wife Angel said that the other day, by the way, for Knox's birthday party, my son just turned one, and uh, she said it on 
She said it on purpose. I think she really said it on accident. She got caught. But I'm starting to wear off on her a little bit. She's starting to combine words, right? The Ohio has now invaded the, the northern Virginia, and I'm starting to convert her on being somebody who doesn't make sense. So, yeah. So here is this manager, and he's been a poor steward. He's spending money that is way more than necessary. He is exceeding the bounds of reason, and he's spending money in all the wrong places. You've done that, and I've done that. And we become wasteful. And that's one of the things that Jesus wants to teach us about our treasure, is that God expects us to be good stewards, not poor stewards. He doesn't want us to just waste our money and just throw it away. Proverbs 21.20 says this, The wise have wealth and luxury, but fools spend whatever they get. Fools spend whenever they can. They just waste their money and they spend it because they don't understand the value of their treasure. You know, my parents, they struggled managing money. I was raised in a, in a broken home, as I told you last week. My parents divorced at a very young age. My mom remarried um, to my stepdad. And they, you know, they all, we always kind of struggled to make ends meet. I mean, we had a nice home. They drove decent cars. We certainly weren't, you know, I mean, come on, look at me, all right? We ate, let's just put it like that. So we weren't malnourished, if that makes sense. Let's just leave it like really kind and gentle and soft. I mean, we spend so much money on food and we waste it, as I said. So they were spending money. Now, if you don't think being a poor steward is unloving, my mom and my stepdad got in a fight and they had just saved $2,000, which isn't, which isn't bad, right? If you've never saved money before, they finally got $2,000 in the bank. My mom and my stepdad had a fight. And guess what we did? We went and we spent it all. You know how upset my stepdad was? He was like, you just spent the $2,000 that we saved? Have you lost your mind? Now, I want you to put yourself in that situation. Imagine somebody taking advantage of all your hard work and all the money that you saved and was just completely reckless. Maybe you just bought a new car and they wrecked it. Maybe you've saved money and they've spent it. Maybe you've just installed something really nice in your home or refinished the space and your kids walk in there and they punch a hole right through the wall and you're like, do you not have any love and respect for me as your father? Jeff Cheatwood and Melissa, they know all about this, okay? They had kids over to their house for many, many years. Jeff's an elder here. And Jeff told me this story. He had just got the basement renovated downstairs. They had the youth group down there and one of the knucklehead youth group kids just puts a gigantic hole right in the wall. I'm just like, are you kidding me right now? You can go talk to him about that story. They know exactly what I'm talking about. But just think about that. Being a poor steward, somebody taking advantage of what you worked for, you don't feel very loved or appreciated or respected. Now let's put ourselves in reference to God. When God entrusts things to us, like our time, like our treasure, like our talents, and like our testimony, can you honestly say, God, I have been a respectful, loving person to you? Have you loved God and loved people with your treasure? Well, I think a lot of us can be guilty of this manager. I think a lot of us can be guilty of this servant. Sometimes we want to be in control. Other times we just want to spend. Well, let's look at what Jesus has to say a little bit more about this, this idea of money. You see, when it comes to money and how you spend it, I want us to think of spending our money like it being sent ahead of you. And you've got two categories in which you can deposit your money. Eternity in heaven with God or eternity in hell with yourself. Now here's the question. Which place have you made the most deposits? When you've spent your money and you've been a steward of God's money that he's entrusted to you, which direction have you invested which direction have you made the most deposits? Here's, the, here's one of the other problems with this man. Not only is he a poor steward, but he's also dishonest. He has cheated his master. I mean, there's nothing worse than finding out that somebody has cheated you out of something. You feel a deep betrayal in your heart. They've scammed you out of money. They've hired you for services and not paid you. Maybe some of my fellow brothers and sisters in here understand exactly what I'm talking about. You go out and you work for somebody, you get half up front, and they decide they don't want to pay you for the rest of the job. I mean, we do stuff like this all the time, and we feel this way a lot of the time. We feel taken advantage of. Well, this man is a cheat. Didn't he know who his master was? Wasn't he aware that once his master would find out, he would get fired, he would lose his job, and he would be in jeopardy? Proverbs chapter 15, verse 3 says this, The Lord is watching everywhere, keeping his eye on both the evil and the good. 
He's a poor steward. He's wasteful. He's dishonest. He's lazy. I don't want to dig. Not the job for me. Reminds me of Chevy Chase, uh, Christmas Vacation, Uncle Eddie. You guys know what I'm talking about? (laughs) He hadn't worked in seven years. It's because he was holding out for a management position. Really? Eddie can't find a job in seven years? Well, yeah, you know, his wife, I can't remember her name, says he's holding out for a management position. He just don't want to do the work. Well, where I come from and what I think the Bible teaches is that you do whatever it takes in order to make ends meet. You get a job and you move on. You work jobs you don't want to work. You flip hamburgers. You work in restaurants. You clean toilets. And then you move up and work through. But yet this man didn't want to do that. He is way too lazy. He's not a hard worker. And here's the deal. You know, when I think about myself and God, look, I don't want to come across as somebody who's like bashing you over the head and like you're wrong and I'm right because I can be just as guilty. So I'm really thinking about, you know, myself in perspective. And when I think about my stewardship and how I've handled the things that God has entrusted to me, you know, I ask myself this question. Have I been dishonest with God? Will God give me a free pass when it comes to my treasure and how I'm a good steward of his money? Am I willing to do whatever it takes, wherever the Lord calls me, whatever job he's asked me to do? You know, I've always respected church leadership who's willing to get their hands dirty. It's one of the reasons why I I, I want to get my hands dirty and I want to work hard despite not being very talented at it, okay? For some reason, the elders have entrusted this, you know, children's ministry rehaul to me. (laughs) You probably couldn't pick a worse person to oversee the management of the construction here. Nevertheless, they're giving me a chance, okay? It's actually going pretty well. If you go down our hallway here, you can see Linda Tamburino and Jim. She's done an awesome job renovating the nursery. Um, We're going to do the toddler room. We're going to renovate that as well. We're getting the new pre-K room up and ready and rocking and rolling, and the kids are absolutely going to love it. And we've actually done a decent job. And when I say we, I mean all the guys at church who've come to help me out. You know what I'm saying? So uh, really big thanks to you guys for helping me out. But I mean, think about this. Is there a job that you'd be like, nope, not doing it? You ever watch Dirty Jobs? Oh yeah, there's some jobs in there. I'm like, man, I would never want to do that if I couldn't, if I didn't have a choice. He's lazy. He has the opportunity. He just doesn't want to do it. God has entrusted you with time and talents and treasure. How are you handling it? Are you willing to do whatever it takes Another thing that this man struggles with, he's proud. He says, look, I'm not gonna beg. And that would be really, it would be really humbling. It would be one of the most humiliating things that I would ever have to do is to go beg for money. Look, I've lost my job. I can't find another one. Would you, would you be willing to help me out? That's what the Christian community is for. We're here for each other. But it was his pride that got in the way. Do you see the track record for somebody who's a poor steward? Pride builds up, laziness builds up, self-entitlement builds up, and you have all of these distractions and all of this self-entitlement when it comes to our treasure. Instead of the Christian point of view, everything belongs to God, and I am managing it for him. You know, there was a, uh, my grandfather, (coughs) he owned a small farm. He he owned uh, two different pieces of property on a different side of the road. And he had actually sold his original farm, and he kept about five acres that he was going to build his new house on. And up behind the five acres, I lived in southern Ohio, so we were like Appalachia country. You know, we had the mountains there, a lot of hills. And there was this farmer that lived right behind him. He owned um, almost 100 acres, really a lot of land. And this guy inherited it from his father, and he was a farmer. You know, he did hay and cattle and stuff like that. Well, he couldn't pay the bills. Couldn't do it. And so it came time where my grandfather actually offered him money for a piece of the property, not just to help get him through, but he was offering him a fair price. I mean, it wasn't over, above, and beyond. The guy absolutely refused to sell any land to pay his bills. The bank came, repossessed everything, and he lost it all. Not just because he wasn't willing to sell to my grandfather, grandfather was fine with that, but because he wasn't willing to sell at all, because he was so proud. And pride does something to us when it comes to our treasure. It makes us incapable of seeing what is true, what is right, what is clear. And we are all in danger of that. Now, he is called to be a good steward. A steward is a trusted caretaker. A steward never becomes an owner, but a steward uses the master's good for the benefit of the master. Now, here's the question for you this morning Are you a steward or are you an owner? Do you believe you owe 
What is yours? Do you believe that you are managing what God has entrusted to you? Because that will change the perspective on everything. Now, I'm not saying everybody's got to give all their money to the church. That's not what I'm saying at all. There are things that we need to do with our money. The Bible says in 1 Timothy, if you don't take care of your household, you're worse off than an unbeliever. We've got to provide for our, our, our families, our kids, our spouses, our parents maybe someday. We are called to be accountable to our families. The Bible says that we should help our brothers and sisters out and, and, with, with burdens. First John says, if you see somebody who is naked or hungry or thirsty and you don't help them out at all, is the love of God really in you? There are things that we should do with our money, but are you a manager or are you an owner? Are you managing God's money on his behalf or are you owning what you believe is yours? That's kind of the difference that Jesus is teaching us here. And so we should have wisdom. While people who love God and love others try not to waste their money, they do try to exercise wisdom. And that's what Jesus goes on to say. Look at the transformation and this slave and this, this steward of the master's money. Look what happens. Once he finds out, he's going to get fired. And this can be a little tricky here, okay? In Luke chapter 16, verse 4, Jesus says this. Here's, here's the steward. Ah! I know how to ensure that I'll have plenty of friends who will give me a home when I'm fired. So he invited each person who owed the money to his employer to come and discuss the situation. And he asked the first one, how much do you owe him, being my master? The man replied, I owe him 800 gallons of olive oil. And so the manager told him, take the bill and quickly change it to 400 gallons. And how much do you owe my employer, he asked the next man. I owe him 1,000 bushels of wheat was the reply. Here, the manager said, take the bill and change it to 800 bushels. The rich man, look at this, the rich man had to admire the dishonest rascal, that's this translation, for being so shrewd. And it is true that the children of this world are more shrewd in dealing with the world around them than are the children of the light. And man, that's the truth. He goes on to say, here's the lesson, here's the point. Use your worldly resources to benefit others and make friends. Then, when your earthly possessions are gone, they will welcome you to an eternal home. You've got two bank accounts of eternity. Which ones are you making deposits in? You see, if you have the love of God, love does something incredible. It not only changes who you are on the inside, but love loves God and it loves people. Now, a lot of people look at this and they say, hey, hold on a second. Is Jesus affirming dishonest gain? Is Jesus really approving a dirty little rascal who's manipulating the situation? No, he's not. That's missing the point. Here's what he is saying. Look at the traits and the characteristics of this bad man and learn something from it. I mean, we can learn good things from bad people, can we not? I mean, think about Stalin and Hitler. We learned some pretty good stuff from them, right? Socialism and communism doesn't work, <laughs> right? You can learn something good from people who are bad and corrupt. And here's this shrewd manager doing whatever it takes to make it right, to provide for himself, and he acts quickly. So here's some principles that we can learn from that. While Jesus is not condoning dishonesty, he is exemplifying these character traits that we should follow after. And we see this in the Bible all the time. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, Solomon, Paul, Peter, John, anybody in the Bible you look at, they were not really great men, but we can learn really important lessons from them. First of all, it's this. The shrewd manager had forethought. Have you ever sat down and made a budget? Have you ever done that? Have you ever sat down and made a budget and followed through with it? <laughs> You're like, look, my New Year's resolution is to get on a budget and stick to it. One weekend, not going to happen. <laughs> you're like hey who spent all the money on amazon what is happening here who made this charge that's the danger of credit cards right you don't know who's spending what mom thinks that there's a hundred dollars left over dad thinks that there's a hundred dollars left over they both think that they could spend it and they end up spending two hundred dollars stuff like that happens all the time here's the deal this shrewd manager had forethought he sat down and he thought about, okay, what do I need to do from this point forward? When it comes to our treasure, if we are going to be a good steward of God's money, we need to sit down and we need to have forethought. He says, oh, I know what I'll do to ensure that I have plenty of friends when I'm fired. I'm going to go and I'm going to settle their accounts. And that's exactly what, I, what he did. Here's the deal. When we begin to be proactive in our love rather than reactive in our love, we will have forethought. 
Have you ever sat down and said, look, I'm going to take part of our budget and our money, and I'm going to use it to, for people who are in need? Homeless people, people who are sick. I'm going, to, I'm going to take part of my budget, and I'm going to make meals for people. I'm going to take part of my budget, and I'm going to write cards and send them in the mail. I'm going to get gift cards for people. I am going to sit down and think, God, how can I honor you with the money that you've given me? Forethought. It's a really powerful thing. The steward not only had forethought, but he also had preparation. When he began to settle the accounts, he began to make friends. He not only prepared for his future, but he acted on his future. What do you and I have to prepare for? After your money's all gone, and it's off to somebody else, whether it gets stolen, or you give it to your family, or you just decide to give it all away, what's next for you? It's eternity. Doesn't the Bible say, lay up treasure in heaven? You see, our stewardship in this life has an eternal impact. Every decision that we make is making a deposit in one way or another. Taking care of our family, paying our bills, giving to the church, caring for people who are in need, saving for a rainy day when the bad times do come. That is, that is really wise to save. Now, you can err on the side of saving, but saving is a really smart thing to do, being prepared That's the kind of attitude that we should have. Why? Because we're moving towards eternity. Don't you think you're probably going to deal with money and investments in the next earth? I mean, we're not just going to be floating in space, guys. The principles you learn in this life is going to impact the next life. And if you're a bad manager of your stuff now, what's going to happen in the future when you're with God in the new heavens and the new earth? Things aren't going to change. And so the Christian life is about becoming a good steward now. He wants us to have forethought. He wants us to be prepared and not wait for the last moment. And he wants us to exercise wisdom. You see, this man acted in such a way that would secure his future. And there was nothing wrong with that. Are you doing the same thing? Are you handling your finances in such a way that you're preparing for eternity? Look, we're all going to stand before God one day. And when he sees the things that we spent our money on, we will have to give an account. And if we are spending our money on alcohol to get drunk, or fantasizing and satisfying our sexual fantasies, or just throwing money away to where it's pointless and meaningless, and we're accumulating all of this stuff that isn't going to matter, we will stand before God, and he's going to say, look, I entrusted this to you, and I'm not going to give you very much because you weren't faithful with a little. Our treasure really does matter. Money matters to God, not because he needs it or because he wants it, because it reflects how we trust him. And so God wants us to exercise wisdom. This man did not say, you know what, one day I'll get things in order and I'll figure it out then. He made the decision to act now and he exercised wisdom in that and he made the most of his time. Here's the other thing that he did, is he had accountability with his finances. Being transparent, it's one of the reasons why I love Seven Christian Church. Look, last church that I belonged to, the finances were never published. Nobody knew where the money was going. Nobody knew how much the staff salary was or how much was spent on the building or where money went. And here, everything's publicized. Everything's made transparent. We want people to know, hey, this is where the money is going. And our our leadership is open to questions, anything that you want to ask. Accountability is important, not only for the church, but even for ourselves. We need to have accountability in our lives. I think one of the reasons why we probably get away with the things that we do is because we lack accountability. If people saw the things that we spend money on, if we really put it out there, I think a lot of us would be like, man, I kind of, I'm kind of wasteful. I kind of buy stuff that I don't need. I kinda, I'm kind of elavagant with it. You know what I mean? I go way above and beyond. Here's what, here's what the manager did. Look what happened in verse 8. The rich man had to admire the dishonest rascal for being so shrewd. You see, he wasn't let off the hook. He was held accountable by the master. He lost his job, yeah. The master said, look, Man, this guy acted, I'm not even mad. (laughs) I mean, he did what was necessary. He's like, wow, this guy actually, it's a little bit more to him than what I thought. And maybe that same principle can apply to us. When God looks at us, he says, look, yeah, you've made mistakes in the past, but now you're willing to act. Now you're willing to be different. Now you're willing to make a change with your treasure. And now you're willing to honor God. That's the principle in the story. Don't get distracted by the details of the story. Look at the principles. Matthew chapter 25, verse 29 says this, to those who use well what they are given, even more will be given to them, and they will have an abundance. But from those who do nothing, 
Even what little they have will be taken away. Here's the biblical principle. If you don't manage well what God has given you, it will be taken away. You won't get to do it anymore. That's that's the risk of accountability. And then finally, application. You look at worldly people, some of them, I mean a lot of them, very intelligent people, very smart. They respond well, they act well, they do the right things when they should, they prepare, they take care of themselves, and it doesn't matter if they're Christians or not, they're just smart with their money. They do the right thing at the right time in the right way, and we can learn from people like that, just like this shrewd manager. And so he applies it, and I hope and pray that as Christians, we will make intelligent investments. I hope and pray that you'll be intelligent with your treasure, that you will make the most of your time, that you will love God and love people with the money that you've been given, with the money that you've been entrusted with. Here's the most important point. I hope and pray that we, when we act with our money, will be laying up treasure in heaven. Look, it's okay to go have a cup of coffee at Starbucks, okay? I was just giving us a hard time. I do it. It's okay to spend money on pleasure and enjoyment, but there does come a time when it's like, okay, this is a little bit too much. This is a little bit over the top. We need to have a little bit more accountability, and we need to be willing to sacrifice some of these things that we want to make an eternal impact for the kingdom of God. And so here's what it boils down to. Are you honoring God with an eternal impact with your treasure? Are you a good steward? Are you a manager of God's stuff? Or do you believe you're an owner of God's stuff? Let's end with Luke 16, 10 through 13. You see, when we minimize our wastefulness and we maximize our wisdom, when we love God and love people with our money, look at what happens in verse, 13, or verse 10. If you are faithful in little things, you will be faithful in large ones. But if you are dishonest in little things, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. And if you are untrustworthy about worldly wealth, who will trust you with the true riches of heaven. This is true. If we can't honor God with this stuff, how do we expect God to trust us in the new heavens and the new earth? And it's right here in the Bible. How we manage our treasure has an eternal impact. We should be loving God and loving people. Verse 12, he says, and if you are not faithful with other people's things, Why should you be trusted with the things of your own? No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other, and you cannot serve both God and money. What a fantastic biblical principle. Trusted with a little, trusted with a lot. Trusted with earthly things, trusted with heavenly things. Trusted with material things, trusted with spiritual things. That's the biblical principle. And the Bible is calling us to love God and love people with our treasure. Are you willing to do whatever it takes to honor that? Are you willing to do that? Whatever it takes, whatever sacrifice you have to make, however you have to rearrange your budget and your schedule, are you willing to say, God, I love you and I trust you with my money and I want to serve you? I'd like to end with a story about a person named Francis Wright. 1824, Back when slavery was in full operation, this is the plantation slavery, not the biblical slavery. There are a lot of wonderful people (coughs) who did a lot of wonderful things. And Francis Wright bought 2,000 of acres in Memphis, Tennessee. And here's the reason why. He wanted to free slaves by giving them an opportunity to work, to buy their freedom. And guess what happened to those 2,000 acres? (laughs) Didn't work out but her heart was in the right place. She was willing to trust God. She was willing to love God and love people, even if it didn't work out in the end. And that is something that I have held true to my heart, and I believe because I think it's what the Bible teaches, that even when you give and when you love and you act out in faith and you love God and you love people with your treasure, God honors the gift even if it's abused by the person who receives it. Even if our church leadership were to mismanage all the money that you gave us, even if the person out on the street corner that you gave 20 bucks to is going to go down the street and buy heroin with it, if your heart is in the right place, God honors the giver and he honors the gift. That's what it means to lay up treasure in heaven. Don't let the